Good evening, welcome everyone. My name is Diane Simons and I'm President of Wheatstone New South Wales. Before I begin, I would like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which I work and live and recognise their continuing connection to land, water and community. I pay respect to Elders past, present and emerging. Tonight is a very special night. First of all, I would like to commend the wonderful and probably the most successful initiative in Sydney this year, the community website that is Denira. The Denira tagline is the power of belonging to a strong community, no matter where you are. What perfect words to connect us all. Welcome to past federal presidents, Ronnie Bogner OAM and Gila Lieberman, all state presidents, members of WEATSO around Australia and in Israel, friends of Denira, thank you all for joining us. If anyone has any questions tonight, please type them in the question bar and we hopefully will be able to answer them all. To our very special guests, Jackie Frank, Dr. Ginny Mansberg and Tracy Cox, who's live from London. Thank you for all agreeing to be on this fabulous panel. We are so looking forward to hearing from you shortly. Before we begin, it would be remiss of me not to update you on the amazing work that WEATSO is doing right now in Israel. This very week, we are honoured the International Day for the Elimination of Violence Against Women. WEATSO is focusing a powerful spotlight on this overwhelming problem, as we are Israel's largest social welfare organisation and the undisputed leader in prevention, treatment, and advocacy in battling domestic violence. WEATSO has been supporting women and families for over 100 years. We have empowered women through their life journey with education programs, legal advice, school, daycare centers, shelters, social services, and leadership programs. WEATSO has been instrumental in developing laws to protect women's rights, and just recently a new law was passed in the Knesset for equal pay. In a few short months, we will be launching our membership campaign 2021. WEATSO has an advisory role to the United Nations. The WEATSO representatives share in the management of the International Alliance, the world's umbrella organisation for various women's organisations. Through membership in these organisations, WEATSO is actively supporting their right for equal rights of both women and children. International WEATSO membership is evaluated annually and it is imperative that we maintain our membership level to keep our consultative status at the United Nations. We turn to you each year to help us keep this status. To our current members, we say thank you. And for those of you who are not yet WEATSO members, we would love you to join this incredible organisation of ours. We know just how tough this year has been for everyone, but our good fortune is that you have continued to support us through these most challenging times. Women working together, connecting and making things happen. WEATSO, doing what matters. Wow, has this topic caused a stir in our community. <laughs> Conversations about women, for women, are important in this process of empowering and validating the role that women play in society. WEATSO and our panel, 50 Shades of Today, are here tonight to bring it all out in the open. Let's get rid of that taboo. This lady needs no introduction in our community. For over the past three decades, Jackie Frank has established herself in various spaces, including fashion, publishing, retail, and brand building. As the founding editor of the iconic women's lifestyle, Murray Claire Australia, as well as the founder of Be Frank Group, a platform designed to build brands and to connect them with their powerful audience. Jackie's work has always had meaning and purpose, just like wheat. So over to you, Jax. Thank you, Di. Thank you very much for a lovely intro. Um, hi, everybody. Very excited to be here with you tonight. Um, and I will get straight into it. First of all, we have two incredibly um, strong women who are trailblazers in their own rights. Firstly, from London, let me introduce you to Tracy Cox. I've known Tracy for, I don't know, Tracy, 30 years. <laughs> we both were in oh, magazines. Really? 
So, yeah, Tracy was at Cosmo and I was at Harper's. And Tracy is one of the world's leading sex and relationship gurus. She has been writing and talking about sex and relationship for decades. In fact, 17 books later, her new book now is Great Sex Starts at 50. So hang in there. We've got plenty of questions. And here next to us in Bellevue Hill is <laughs> Ginny Mansberg. Most of you know Ginny as Ginny the GP. Yep, Ginny Ginny the GP. (laughs) Ginny is Sunrise's Channel 7 resident doctor, regularly appearing on the show, sharing her medical knowledge and expertise. Ginny also appeared on as a doctor, not appeared as a person who had an embarrassing body, but Ginny <laughs> appeared on Embarrassing Bodies Down Under and hosts a fabulous podcast with her great friend and mine, Shelley Horton, called Things You Can't Talk About on TV. Ginny's also just launched her new book, The M Word. Here, Ginny, that's your time. (laughs) Tracy, have you got yours? Let's have a look at what you all say. Okay, lovely. Now, before we get straight into it, what I want to say is, please, tonight is about you guys out there. We want to know any, ask us anything. It'll be completely and utterly um, anonymous. I will not reveal who has sent in the question. And we want to be able to make this as powerful as possible. So if you've got a question that you've always wanted to ask but been too embarrassed, please, tonight is your night to do that. Okay, so I think we'll go straight to you in London, Tracy. Your book, Great Sex Starts at 50. Let's start there. First of all, is this true? Why does it start at 50? Um, It is true, but let me tell you, it does need a bit of an attitude adjustment. And the reason why I wrote this book, which is my 17th book about sex, was I was thinking, you know what? I'm probably done with writing books about sex now. There's nothing else to write about. And then I turned 50 and suddenly I thought, oh my God, there is so much to write about because sex after 50 and sex pre-50 are literally completely different ball games. Like before, I mean, also I was quite naive about it all because I obviously knew about menopause. I was um, went perimenopause when I was about 48, but I honestly thought nothing's gonna happen to me with my sex life because I've written all these books I know everything. I had a high sex drive. Suddenly I went through menopause, came out the other side. And previously I would have cut off an arm to have sex. Post menopause, I wouldn't have even loped off a little toe. My desire just completely went. So I did what all good authors do when I wanted to fix the problem. I wrote a book about it. And (laughs) in the course of writing the book, yes, it can get better. It's just a very different style of sex. And I think if you can adjust your head and realize that, then you can often have way better sex post 50, especially as a woman. Hold that thought because I want to know about this having way better sex adjusting your attitude. In the meantime, I want to switch over to you, Ginny, because Tracy brought up a really important fact that she hit menopause and basically sex wasn't the priority for her. What physically goes on with women when they go through menopause in terms of sex? Well, it's not just one thing, right? So for a start, if you're having hot flushes, anybody climbing on top of you is just like, go away, do not come near me, you're making me hot. Then, like, you have not slept. By that stage, you're like, you've been in perimenopause for a few years and you haven't slept for ages, so you're exhausted. So, basically, I'll give you seven minutes between 9 and 9.07. What can you do in that time? That's not a great recipe for awesome sex. And then if we can mention the V word, sorry, I love a good vagina and I would say that I am the queen of the dry vaginas. The vagina doesn't do that well after menopause. Well, Um, what actually happens? So your vagina uh, will, it's like a self-cleaning oven, like a self-sourcing pudding. It just makes its own lovely liquid that actually does a great job of cleaning it out. Um, And you don't need to go in there and excavate it and clean it out or do anything other random than that. Um, But basically the fluid, which is around about a teaspoon a day um, in premenopausal women, is turbocharged by sugar and estrogen take away the estrogen, which is exactly what happens in menopause, and your poor little cells are not doing that well at making that 
you know, self-sourcing pudding liquid. And so anything that uh, dries out the vagina is just not good for sex. And um, if it hasn't happened at 50, awesome, but it will inexorably get worse. Gosh. So by 60, it's um, often all over Red Rover for a lot of women. Right. Okay. So Tracy, you talk about a different kind of sex post 50. Can you mm. tell us a little bit about this? I think you talk about the difference between penetration versus grinding. Yeah. Talk, tell, yeah. tell us about this. And um, building on what Ginny said, that's exactly what's happening. So your vagina is less elastic, it's drier, you're more prone to urinary tract infections. And also what estrogen does is that it, um, it make, makes you less responsive. You become a bit desensitized, so it can take you longer to get aroused. Um, some women have difficulty reaching orgasm. But the good news is that all of these things are surmountable. And there are so many, the joy of being a woman in this day and age is that there are so many great treatments out there that can get around this problem. And I would would say that the, the big game changer for me was estrogen pessaries, which can bring back the vagina of your youth. It was quite extraordinary, the difference it can make. But yes, it is all about changing our concept from thinking about sex as young sex. When we think about sex, we tend to think of young bodies, which is when, when women get all hung up about, well, I don't look sexy. Well, you probably don't look like what you did when you were 20, but that really doesn't matter. It doesn't mean you're not sexy. And we think about penetration-focused sex. Sex post 50 is often not so much about penetration because his erections are a bit wobbly. Um, often penetration hurts. So it moves. It, it's almost like foreplay gets a promotion and becomes the real part of sex which for women as we all know the clitoris is outside the vagina not inside the vagina so if sex becomes slower more pen i'm sorry more foreplay focused it's often way better for women so they'll end up having more orgasms having a lot i mean for men you know the big deal is intercourse it's this penis is the star of the show and that's the main bit of sex most men think of that as sex but it's not for women. That's not when most women have their orgasms anyway. So moving it to this slower, more erotic, foreplay style sex is a really good idea. And so hang on a minute. You also talk about the theory of use it or lose it. Hmm. Yes, yes. So what I'm saying, yes, there is. So, so the best thing you can do for your genitals, and Ginny will back me up on this, is to, is to keep on having regular sex. It's almost like, you know, if you stop running for the bus after a certain age, you're not going to be able to run for the bus. We have to exercise all of our body. You can do pe um, Kegel exercises, pelvic toning exercises. Orgasm also exercises your um, genitals because, you know, the contractions bring the vagina close together. So, so on one hand, it becomes less penetration focused, but a little bit of penetration, you're quite right, is good for you. But it's more the orgasms that produce the, the health benefits. But if you want to have penetrative sex, then yes, you, you really should have regular sex. That is the best thing what you can do. What is regular, Tracy? Well, I always say find your own normal because, I mean, for the health benefits, they say once a week. Now, I don't know too many people in long-term relationships post-50 who are having sex once a week. So really seriously, if you're doing it for the health benefits and trying to keep your genitals in shape, definitely have solo sex, sex sessions, hard to say at this time of the morning. Um, you, mean, about you mean masturbation? Yeah, masturbation so at least try and have an orgasm at least once a week and then I would say have some type of sex once a fortnight and and that should be quite good now again sex that sex might be a quickie it might be an oral sex session it might be you know both of you doing a mutual masturbation session it could be lots of different things it doesn't necessarily mean intercourse but some type of sexual activity to keep everything in good shape is a good idea well I mean in your book you also have a chapter on how to survive in a sexless relationship. Do you, ex yeah. do you expect um, that to be, well, first of all, do you expect that to be the, one of the most read sections in the book? But it's not just women who go off sex, is it? It's also men as well. Yes. And uh, do you know, most of the time, if somebody writes to me and says, you know, I don't know what to do, my husband's gone off sex and he won't talk to me about it, I always, my first question is, is he over 45? And if he's over 45, it generally doesn't mean he's having an affair. It generally means he's having erection problems. And the one thing that really shocked me writing this book is the amount of people and couples where the man has an erection problem and he doesn't tell his wife or his partner. And, just, and then what usually happens is if the couple don't talk about sex, 
they then he his sex life then becomes solo sex sessions him masturbating to porn basically and that's that's all that happens and the amount of my friends who talk about everything so close but will not talk about the aging of their genitals so quietly they stop having sex but they never ever have that conversation of why or hey honey have you noticed we haven't had sex for the last five years and that is really dangerous for a relationship so Ginny talk tell us about this so that that men's erection becomes mm -hmm. I mean there's extremes isn't there where they don't can't get erection but also you were talking a little bit off camera about yeah, so I, I think the thing to remember about an erection is what it is, is that there are some very spongy muscles in the penis and they fill with blood. And so what it requires is the arteries to open wide, allow blood to flow into those muscles in the penis, then for there to be a little clamp that clamps and keeps uh, the blood inside the penis. And then after he's finished and had an orgasm, those uh, little one-way valves relax and the blood can drain out again. If he has arterial disease, so disease of the arteries, it will stop those blood vessels opening up and those muscles being able to fill with blood. And what doctors say is that erectile dysfunction precedes coronary artery disease, which is the biggest mm. ki killer of men in Australia, by three years. So that if you have a man with erectile dysfunction in front of you, he is sitting duck for, for a heart, heart attack. attack. Mm -hmm. And in fact, I had a patient a few years ago who um, was a notorious doctor avoider. He was a diabetic smoker, high blood pressure, didn't take any of his medications, but came in and wanted some Viagra. And I said, yes, you can have it as long as you go and have this coronary artery scan. And they didn't let him out of the hospital. And that night yeah. uh, he was fasted and the next morning he had a quintuple bypass, so five vessel bypass, because the reason why he couldn't get an erection was because he had arterial disease of the penis, wow. which is so just, if your husband can't get it up, that's, you know, one thing, you know, he could be masturbating to porn. That is definitely a possibility. But the other possibility is he has a condition that, you know, he needs to see a doctor mm -hmm. about. So don't, mm -hmm. don't ignore that one. That's a really big one. No one mm -hmm. likes to talk about sex, really, do they, Tracy? I mean, you know, and there are, what you've just said, physical benefits mm -hmm. to talking about sex. What are the other benefits about talking about sex with your partner, Tracy? I think that if you can talk about sex, you can get through any sexual problem that there is. But it's quite interesting with talking about sex in that in the beginning, when you're first with somebody, all you do is talk about sex. You're like, we're amazing. We're doing this. And isn't this great? And I'd love to do that. And, you know, you're full of it. But the minute you hit a problem, suddenly it's like, oh, this isn't so much fun now. But I think the onus is, particularly in straight relationships, the onus is on women to get men to open up as per usual, because seriously not getting an erection for men is a psychological catastrophe most of them you know like, women are pretty cool i think we go yeah okay my vagina's not what it not what it used to be and we're so used to things happening to our body men aren't so i think they really really don't you know they panic they they you know i think they know Ginny, about the heart attack risk which makes them panic even more like you know put their head in the sand and say this isn't happening um so you know talking about sex can as you said save lives but it can certainly save relationships like you asked me a question before about sexless relationships well I mean some people particularly couples who probably have a low sex drive never really got into sex that much once they get post 50 he's having erection problems she's having pain on penetration sometimes they just go you know what we've had enough sex we're going to stop having sex that is fine but you have to have that conversation you have to say how do you feel about that and you know and and because if you don't do that what happens is affection stops because then either of you are like god if I kiss him too much or I kiss her or whatever then it might lead to sex and Oh, I'm a bit nervous about that. So the couple then stop showing affection. And if you have no sex and no affection, what have you got? I mean, the relationship generally dies. But if you can talk about it all, if you can joke about it and be honest about it and have open conversations, you would be fine. Mm. Well, I'm just going to take a little left, left shift here because we've talked a lot about how, you know, the women's body changes. So um, there's a lot of people out there, and I've been asked this a lot about menopause. And um, the definition of menopause, what is it? How do you know you're in it? And how long does it last for? Well, there's a very technical definition. So menopause itself is 12 months uh, from the first day of your last menstrual period. So if you can actually remember that far back, 12 months later, you know, open a bottle of champagne, you've hit menopause, that's it. Uh, how do you know you're in it if you've got a good memory? But I think a lot of women just kind of 
work out, oh, I, I don't think I've had a period for, for ages. But there are other women who've had a hysterectomy. So I don't know that, you know, that they haven't had a period. A lot of women have a marina, which is a, an IUD that contains progesterone. I wouldn't know that they haven't had a period because they don't get periods on marinas anyway. Mm. So a lot of women don't know. So they're kind of looking for the symptoms. Mm. Um, and so, I mean, I think we can go through all the symptoms that happen in the vagina, but there's, yeah, the hot sweats, the brain fog, the insomnia, the aches and pains. In some studies, aches and pains are more common than hot flushes. Mm. And given that hot flushes impact 75% of women and a third of them find them unbearable, which is so one in five women find their hot flushes unbearable, no, they actually can't cope with them. Um, the mental health stuff, it's really, it's and, quite complex. And when should somebody go see their doctor? We don't necessarily need to go and see a doctor. I mean, I think there is so much in women's health that gets medicalised in a way that's unfortunate. I mean, I think birth is one of those things where we just sort of medicalise it too much. It's In most cases, women will squat in a field and do it reasonably easily. And I think menopause is a similar thing. Mm. If your hot flushes are just one or two here and there and they're not worrying you, if your brain fog is not that bad, if your mental health is reasonably good and your vagina is performing okay, which... What is a, what is an okay performing vagina? Well, <laughs> I <was> just, so <laughs> I think Tracy's just kind of gone through the fact that as long as it's serving you and what you want from it, you're okay. But, I mean, it's not just vaginal dryness because there's, you know, well, your bladder, your incontinence, you. your itchiness, you get all sorts of skin conditions and, you, oh, it's just awesome. And it's often not at 50. It's often not the day you hit menopause. It's often much, much, much later because what we know, and this is actually really sad, by age 65... 80% of women have what we call a genitourinary syndrome of menopause and 7% of women seek help for that. But what does that mean? So that is any vaginal bladder symptom associated with menopause. So whether it's a dry vagina, skin problems, incontinence, uh, re recurrent urinary tract infections, all of those things get into a bucket that we call genitourinary syndrome of menopause for which 7% of women seek help from a doctor. But that's what I'm saying. You're saying Ridiculous. they don't need to go. But the thing is, women are notoriously bad at looking after themselves and taking themselves to a doctor versus looking after the family or the parents or the children or whatever. So, so then shouldn't we say that they should go and get checked at some point? If you don't have symptoms that are worrying you, you do not need to go to the doctor. You're going to go for your regular, um, what we now call the cervical screening test. It used to be a pap test. You're going to go for your regular breast checks. Um, I believe most women should have a bone density test at the time that they hit menopause. I think that's really critically important. At some point, you're going to have your blood pressure checked. But do you need to go to the doctor mm. and say, so mm. I think I'm in menopause, what do I need to do now? No, you don't need to do that. But if you are having any symptoms at all, I don't think you should be just sucking it up, princess. I actually think you should be having a conversation, at least with your girlfriends, mm. to talk about it, and, to and know how, what's normal. And mm. how does menopause um, <laughs> normally disrupt your sex life? So there are, it, it's not always at age 50, but generally you start to produce less lubricating fluid so that you are, um, your vagina is uh, narrower, it bleeds more easily, uh, it's uncomfortable to have sex. Uh, on top of that, your libido goes out the window, even if you don't have a low testosterone, which we should talk about testosterone levels in women, because you're often exhausted and you've got hot flushes. And then, you know, on top of that, you know, there are other things that happen around menopause. Some women do a wee when they, when they have sex, which is actually you should see a doctor about that because that normally means you've got a prolapse. So as the penis goes in, it, um, it stops uh, what has become a little kink in the urethra, which is the uh, tube that takes wee from the bladder out to, to the vulva. Mm -hmm. um, and then as the penis goes in, it straightens that tube and allows all the wee to come out. So that normally means a prolapse. So there are things that can happen if you're gonna, if you're worried about weeing and leaving a wee stain on the sheets, that is so awkward. That is so awful. Very few women will feel mm. good about their bodies and feel good about having sex if that's happening. Which takes me back to you, Tracy, about creating good sexual habits so you'll be in great shape later. What are you referring to when you say that? Um, I think, first of all, I'm um, just talking to, about Ginny saying about going to the doctor. It's quite interesting that with all of my friends, um, some of them sail through menopause, some of them have an awful time. But invariably, I think, um, I know that HRT isn't for everyone, but there are certainly some very low dose safe ways to, to make things better where you're not getting the dry vagina, the urinary tract infections, all that awful stuff. 
Um, so I would say if you are having any, well, Tell me like people who might be listening. Yeah, with me, what made the huge difference with me was um, an estrogen gel, which is just a, a gel that you put on, I put it on my, my knee, I, pump, I have one pump every two days. That made such a difference to my skin, to my um, vaginal lubrication. I also use a vaginal pessary, which is an estrogen pessary, which you just put up inside. And that was amazing once or twice a week. Mm -hmm. And then um, progesterone be, um, helped me with my sleep. So, and that's kind of the little cocktail that most of my friends um, are on. And, and a lot of them tried really hard not to be on it. Some of them can't do it because of um, breast history and breast cancer history and stuff. But testosterone, interestingly, because that is the main thing that stops spontaneous desire where you just, you know, something taps your initial, you know, when you're younger, you could just be walking along and think, God, I feel like sex. When you're older, not so much. You tend to have to create desire. But I tried testosterone gel. And sure enough, it, I mean, it works a treat to get your libido back. The trouble is, it brings back everything else. Like it makes you more competitive, more ambitious. It was like I turned back into my 30-year-old self. And I was like, I don't know if I want to be 30-year-old self again. Because, you know, <laughs> I, was so, I was so male. I was in a spin club next to this guy who was going for it and I swear to god I nearly gave myself a heart attack trying to keep up so that wasn't for me but it does definitely work to bring your libido back to testosterone gel well hang on a minute somebody's asked us a question but it's about estrogen and um, pessaries thank you um are they safe for someone who's had a hormonally driven breast cancer so this is um quite an interesting and controversial question mm -hmm. so um this is not medical advice. You need to go and talk to your oncologist and talk about this very specifically. Mm. Um, but there is no evidence that the low dose of estrogen that is applied directly to the vagina twice a week is actually absorbed in the body at high enough doses to promote um, hormone dependent breast cancer. Having said all of that, if you go and get a packet of um, estrogen pessaries, or there's actually a cream that you can get as well instead of the pessaries. If you get that and you open up the insert, it's covered in all of these hideous kind yeah. of warnings that this is going to give you breast cancer. Even if you don't have breast cancer yourself, it's absolutely terrifying. Like, don't look at the package insert. Mm -hmm. It's actually government legislation that should have, like, it's mm -hmm. just anti-female government legislation <laughs> that should have been burnt at a stake. But, you know, at any rate, we've got this sort of these inserts there so go and talk about it with your oncologist most oncologists say it's fine you can do it and tracy i want to go back because i did read i saw an interview you did and you haven't given us that same little bit of um information and i want to draw this out of you when you were talking about young sex isn't better sex it's different sex and you were talking about the difference that happens after 50 and you were quite specific and I thought that was really interesting so about the position and support etc cetera, etc cetera. do you know what I'm talking about no not really oh, <laughs> it was your words it's like, know, it's it's, it was like a, no pen it wasn't about penetration but it was about grinding, grinding and the position and oh, yeah, yeah yeah okay so there's a couple of things that are real game changers if sex is painful for you or if he's having erection difficulties the two things that i think really really work best is to change the style of thrusting now that old-fashioned style where he pulls right back and then plunges straight back in the word plunge will make most of you wince it makes me wince um that doesn't tend to work post 50 what does work is if you keep your pelvises close together and grind together sort of in a circular motion now this works for any age for most women because it, it sort of stimulates the clitoris it stimulates the inner clitoris and it works a lot better especially if you want to wear a, a um, penis ring that's got a little vibration on it that's what? the technique that you use you can use a, a penis <laughs> ring that's got a little vibrator on it so if it fits over the top of the penis and you, it's got a little vibrator that works on the clitoris so it vibrates on the clitoris during penetration which can up your chances of orgasm so that's a really good idea and you have to use that style of grinding because otherwise the clitoris isn't in contact with the vibrator so it wouldn't work <laughs> the other thing you can use is what's called a buffer hilarious oh, what? <laughs> you know, Australia, a buffer, buffer. Now, 
a buffer, B-U-F-F-E-R. It's like a, it's like a squishy ring that sits at the base of the penis and it stops him going in too deeply. So penetrating too deeply. So if it's you're with your stop partner, sign. What? <laughs> like a stop sign. No yes. more entry. <laughs> <The> gate's closed. <laughs> no, it's like something that it's, I mean, the biggest brand is called Onut, and it's like something that sits on top. Yeah. So it literally stops him going too deep. Because what can happen is if sex is painful and you're having intercourse and you're saying to your partner, look, you know, you need to take it slow, you need to take it slow. Just when they're about to orgasm, they're not thinking about stuff like that. They're just going to let loose. And if you're sitting there on the other end of it thinking this is going to really hurt, the fact that if your um, partner's wearing a buffer, so literally it physically stops him going in too hard, you can both relax and enjoy sex. It's so really effective for people with painful sex. Very effective. Okay. That's well, you know what? what you, see, if, if sex hurts, what are some of the solutions you've just given them to us? But so I'm going to actually jump back because, Ginny, we've had a couple of questions going back to the gels and things, and I think we need to answer yeah. them. Are all the gels you've been talking about all only available via prescription from your GP or are they over the counter? So anything with hormones in it has to be on prescription, but there are some not bad lubricants um, and vaginal moisturizers that are available over the counter mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. my favorite vaginal uh, mm -hmm. lubricant is just garden variety coconut oil coconut think, oil that's my favorite it doesn't irritate it's never good the problem with most uh, water-based lubricants is that they're going to last about three minutes and then they're going to have basically gone out <laughs> yeah. they don't stay in for very long yeah. and so the problem is that if your partner lasts which they start lasting an awfully long time as their penises get smaller and their <laughs> sensation just sort of doesn't work so well so you know 12 minutes later this lubricant has just left the station <laughs> ages ago so coconut oil is a stay up is That's coconut my... oil the same as baby oil no no, no 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 not baby oil you want to go for coconut oil from like the health food section of your supermarket just grab that Warm it in your hands and stick what do you it directly. Warm it in your hands. Yeah, because otherwise it's solid. You need oh. to sort of make, melt it a bit and mm -hmm. shove it directly on the penis. Oh, that's a bit too graphic with my hands. I'll leave them away. But <laughs> All yeah, right. so you want to stick that directly on. But otherwise, yes, or anything containing hormones needs a prescription. And the estrogen cream only. So is the estrogen cream only safe for for breast cancer risk if it's put in your vagina rather than anywhere else on your body? So the estrogen cream that is designed for the vagina mm. is specifically designed for the vagina. It comes with an applicator. I do not recommend that you use the applicator if you have it because the applicator is like impossible to clean. Okay. So just use the applicator to work out how much you need and put it on your finger and use it that way. The estrogen gel, there are two that are available in Australia at the moment. Um, one I really don't like because it's quite slimy and it falls all over the floor and it's pretty gross. But there is a new one that's out that, Tracy, you guys have had for ages and it's just, anyway, we finally got it here. What is it? I'm, I, I'm a doctor, so I'm not allowed to say Okay, the, you can write it down and I can say it. Yeah, I'll write it down. Because <laughs> I'm sure, because we're well, saying, look, so if you use a lubricant, yeah. do you, I mean, <laughs> estrogel. It's yes. E S T R O G E L. I don't estrogen. like the other one, but anyway, I'm not promoting any. No, we're not saying, I'm you're, to, no, we're but, not saying you know, you're promoting yeah. it. But as a woman, you, uh, I'm telling you, it's me, the sex expert. Estrogel, what a joke. So, um, okay, I think we've answered the next question, which was if you use a lubricant, do you insert or apply to your partner's penis? So the lubricant oh. goes into the, on the partner's oh. penis. I, if you're using coconut oil. I would put that on directly onto the penis because otherwise... And if it, you're using... No, estrogel is going on your arm or on your leg oh, because that's whoops. actually proper HRT. So that's not going oh. direct. So that's a very different thing. So okay. um, in, if you're using something horrible like KY jelly, so not my favourite, they put it on colonoscopy and that is going to literally be off in two minutes. It's just not going to do the job. So don't bother with that stuff. Okay, thank you. Let's move on. Um... Wow. Now, what about, you talked a little bit, Tracy, about someone saying, oh, I don't feel that I look like I did and all that kind of stuff. You know, there's a lot of women today, a lot of divorce, high rate of divorce and being single in the second part of your life. So it's not about um, how you look, is it? It's about how you feel. Talk a little bit about that. 
Yeah, very much so. Um, for my book, I interviewed hundreds of women and it was very, very interesting about um, body image in that they, they fell almost perfectly into two, two sort of different camps of women. You had women who were very much um, like in, almost enjoying the second part of that. Well, they weren't almost enjoying, they were very much enjoying the second part of their life. They were like, okay, so what? My breasts are droopy. So what? I've got stretch marks. I, I feel fantastic. I'm free of all these pesky periods and PMT and stuff. I feel like I'm really sexy. I've got more time. I feel more confident. I'm less people pleasing in bed and I'm having great sex. And these were the women who were not only having great sex, they were having more sex, they had less um, problems with um, all those menopausal symptoms, probably because they were more relaxed about them. On the other side, you had women who absolutely hated what was happening. They fell into that cultural group of thinking they were barren, they were dried up. You know, they felt really bad, like society had judged them and they were now, you know, like dried up old women. You know, they're awful things that people say in society. They were absolutely hung up on the fact that they didn't look like when they were 20. I hate that my body after children, I hate this, you know, I hate my thighs, I hate, and they're not enjoying sex because they're not having sex because they're too ashamed to show their body. So it's, the thing is, is that we all know, even Victoria's Secret models who society says have the perfect body, have body image issues. It is nothing to do with what you actually look like. It is all to do with your attitude towards your body. So people say, you know, well, to fix body image issues, you know, go on a diet. No, don't go on a diet. Exercise, because exercise improves blood flow, which will mean that, you know, you're going to be more sensitive to stimulation and stuff and feel better about yourself. But did, what you actually look like has no relationship to how you feel about your body. It really doesn't. The things that can boost body um, self-esteem is to have more sex. Because if you have sex with somebody, if somebody's you know, consistently and regularly having sex with you, your brain can't help but go, well, hang on a minute. I can't be too bad because somebody's having sex with me. You get a boost, a subconscious boost or a conscious boost every time that happens. The other thing that research has shown is that the more sexually skilled or the more competent you feel about your sexual skills, the more confident you are in bed. So if you know that you're a great lover, you're going to be less inclined to be looking down and going, oh my God, I've just seen a big roll of fat or, you know, God, I'm looking a bit old here. You're not thinking about that. You're thinking, wow, look at how powerful I am that I'm making, giving this person so much pleasure. Mm. And I mean, because, yeah, Ginny, you must see people and, and in terms of the whole body image scenario. Yeah. How Do you think it's still as prevalent as it always was? I think it's different. And Tracy, I'm, I'm sure you'd agree with me. I think it's like almost it's more prevalent in women our age now than it is in the younger girls. Certainly Instagram hasn't helped with this entire thing. And so Instagram and Snapchat is driving, there are still eating disorders amongst our kids, but we've got this entire new generation of women who are also mm. really body conscious mm. because of social media and so I do think it's um, mm. really problematic. Can I just put a word in for any of our single sisters who are listening to us tonight? Um, you remember that sex ed talk that you had back in the 80s or the 70s when you were at high school? It's still around. I have had so many patients recently in their 60s with gonorrhea and chlamydia and herpes it mm. is still out there so i would um still wear a condom if you're in that exploratory phase of your life mm. and don't take the condom off until you are absolutely sure that the person you're with is um is, is clean yeah clean of disease at any rate um we've had a lovely question i mean i am 51 for the past six months my sex drive has been in overdrive Oh, lucky Look you. you. <laughs> not, co not complaining. And after 30 years of marriage, which I was actually going to say, I've got a question which goes against this, but anyway, after 30 years of marriage, four children, two who still live at home, I'm finally starting to enjoy and explore my sexuality with my loving husband. Although he's a little confused at the dramatic change. I'm sure he is, <laughs> but I'm sure he's pretty excited too. Um, interested if others during perimenopause have experienced such a, um, uh, what's, I can never say that, viral, a viral and demand for sex prior to or if a reduced sex drive takes hold. So because she's saying she's in perimenopause and she's absolutely gone sex crazy, are things going to change or is that something or is this unusual? Like what the hell's going on? 
<laughs> Maybe she just read Tracy's book and it just, <laughs> Tracy, that was it. That was a secret. Well done. Maybe you should be giving this uh, webinar. I'll just go away now. No, I mean, in, enjoy it. I think that's awesome. I, yeah. I don't really know what's going to happen in the future. I wouldn't have necessarily predicted this at 51, but, but hey, that's awesome. But there's no medical <laughs> reason for this. No. Tracy? No, no. It's, it's definitely not uncommon for women to get this sort of midlife, you know, lust, mid, mid, you know, midlife lust. And um, it can be, it's not uncommon at all. I actually did a chapter in my book called um, Women Aren't Bored. No, no, women don't have low libido, we're just bored. And what can happen is, um, I think sometimes it's the shift in our, in our mental attitude. We become less people pleasing, we're more open to exploring new things. And it's fantastic that you're exploring it with, a, you know, partner you've been with 30 years. It's quite uncommon because often women do this when they leave their partners and start a relationship with somebody new but yes it's not uncommon at all and I think it's just because we move away from feeling judged we move away from like is somebody gonna you know we, we're, we're more confident we're able to ask for what we want we're more like hey why don't we try this you've got a bit more time your kids have grown up so so go for it but it, no I have heard of that before and this was in some of the women that I spoke to definitely reported that it wasn't very high it was probably about two mm, percent of the of the women but yeah it was definitely a thing and enjoy it it's, there's no reason why that's going to go away oh, i think she's having a great time <laughs> but um can you really age proof your libido i would say yes you can age proof your libido and you've got to remember that you know a lot of the things that happen with what we call menopausal symptoms can also be just your lifestyle choices catching up with you midlife because that's what often what happens when we go through menopause it's often you know if you've been drinking too much smoking too much not you know exercising it's often to do with that as well so in terms of age proofing your libido you know staying healthy staying fit is a big thing about it but also in terms of like making sure you've got a, a good libido later on you need to think about things like for instance make sure that you're physically prepared for sex you make sure you're fully aroused that is a key thing for people who have uncomfortable sex or painful sex is they they're like well what's wrong with me what's wrong with me i used to be able to only have like two minutes of foreplay and then be ready well because of all the hormonal things that's, that are going on, you're going to take longer to get aroused. So make sure that you're really physically prepared for sex would be one thing that I would say. Think about things like say, um, especially if you're on different medications or you've got a few aches and pains, um, think about the time of the day that you have sex. Maybe nighttime isn't the right time. Think about when do you feel best? You know, when do you and your partner feel mm -hmm. best? It might be that suddenly you have it at you know, 11 o'clock in the morning. There are so many different things that you can do to keep you know your libido just as high and keep having sex so much but you just have to think outside the square and again not try to cram yourself into this what we used to do when we were young box think of it differently and one question i want to just pivot to here is we're assuming that you want to have sex things like that but what do you do if you love your partner and you don't want to have sex with them anymore you do talk about that don't you yeah and that that is common, not just with people over 50, but anyone who's in a long term relationship. And the reason why this happens is that we think of love and sex as sort of like bedfellows. They go together like bacon and eggs. Well, they actually don't. What we need for great love and what we need for great sex are two totally different things. For love, you need intimacy, you need trust, you need safety, you need security. For sex, to, for good sex, you need eroticism, you need danger, you need forbiddenness. Now, in a good relationship, most of us work on these nice qualities, you know, the love qualities, which dampens desire and this is why you have the couples you get on the best often have no desire for each other because they've, they've done nothing to be you know there's nothing for lust to feed off and the couples in the worst relationships that are roller coaster and on again off again and arguing often have the best sex because all those qualities that feed lust like insecurity and you know uncomfortable you've got to be pushed out of your comfort zone to have good sex like no one really if you said to somebody what's the best sex you've ever had in your life no one really is going to say well on Saturday night with my husband of four 40 years or maybe that woman she might say that but most <laughs> women know, they would say oh well that one time that we did this or we had sex in public or it's nearly always dangerous naughty sex so if you are in a good relationship with your partner you love them but don't fancy them you have to literally force that to happen you have to put yourself you have to push yourselves out of your comfort zones and start that way you will then see each other you know as lovers again as opposed to you know ted who takes out the bins type of thing 
Now, I want to move into um, our final kind of section of the evening, which is about breaking the taboos. Um, because, and I'm hoping that people will send us in some questions of things that they have wanted to ask. But Ginny, I'll start with you. What do you, what, like, what do you think are the high, like three things, the taboos that women want to know but too scared to ask? About menopause? Anything. Um, so I think <laughs> one taboo that nobody talks about but that's almost universal is chin hair. So we won't discuss that here, but I know you all have it, so we'll just move right on. <laughs> yeah, but um, I don't understand. That's a, take a tweezer, get 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 um, laser. But that's people just hard. don't talk, people don't talk about Oh, chin hair. having it. Okay. Yeah. Um, the other thing is I would say an itchy vulva and an itchy vagina. I think if you have that, I think you need to go and take your kid off and show it to a doctor, unfortunately, because I think mm -hmm. that there are a couple of not great conditions that happen to the postmenopausal vagina. That, what kind of condition? I think, you know, uh, lichen planus is, is a big one and lichen what is sclerosis. That? So these, you know what, I'm not going to go into all the detail because it's some people might be eating so and some people <laughs> might be watching a yeah, rerun. Some people over might it. be listening and think, oh, my God, what I've got is Google actually it. a condition. No, and just Google it. If you have um, lichen sclerosis, which is kind of white, papery, um, thickened skin of the vulva, um, you might look at it and go, well, you know, it doesn't have any hair on it anymore. It's just sort of a pale colour. There's nothing to worry about. 5% transformed to cancer. So we do need to, you do just need to go and show an itchy vulva to somebody. And if you go to your doctor and say, my vulva's really itchy, and he goes, great, here's a cream. No need for me to have a look. Um, change we'll change doctors. We'll go to a new doctor. Yeah, because that's probably not going to be... Um, uh, yes, your best move. Mm. And can I? I'm just going to be really rude for one minute. Can I explain what female ejaculation is? Mm. Um, so this is very controversial because a lot of men claim to have been with female ejaculators, and some women claim to be female ejaculators. So the studies that have been done on this, How, what percentage of women are we talking about? It's not really well documented what percentage because people claim don't it. talk. Correct. But what we know is that. Uh, there have been studies that have been done where women, where um, an ultrasonographer was actually scanning the pelvic area of women as they became sexually aroused. And what you saw was that their bladder filled up and filled up and filled up of urine. And after they had an orgasm, let go. Bladder's empty. So I'm just saying a female ejaculator has just an away on you. So that's is, fine. Is, is that a medical problem that can be addressed or is it just... Not really. It's just one of those things. It's not a huge amount. It's not a huge volume. We're talking about 10 mils, maybe two teaspoons. Okay. It's not a huge amount. And and just my last thing, sorry, just Tracy, I'm sorry, I'm stealing from you, but porn is often talked about as something that could help revitalise a relationship. But we have reasonably good studies out of Australia these days that show that most porn shows non-consensual, violent sex. Um, he might be verbally abusive. He might tie her up. Um, it is um, all over when he ejaculates on her face. It's not um, the kind of sex that most women enjoy. Mm -hmm. And while it can really arouse men, it can set them up for sort of a, a, a sexual problems. And it's not necessarily going to be the kind of thing that's going to arouse a lot of women. Some women will get off on it but not everybody will get off on it. And I don't think it's necessarily an antidote um, to, uh, you know, to a flagging sex life. And, and don't forget in this country in Australia, the average male happens upon porn for the first time at 11 is the average age in Australia and 13 for, go for girls. And they are seeing that kind of pornography before they've so much as held a, a girl's hand or kissed her. And that's what they think sex is. And it's, pretty grim it's a bit of a grim scene and Tracy you've always been a big fan of sex toys um you have two ranges with love honey your chapter heading is why sex toys can solve most of your problems can they they can just going back briefly to porn there is a lot of porn out there that's very female friendly now so if you google female friendly porn there are some absolutely stunning fantastically beautifully done ethical porn sites out there for women so if you stop thinking porn and think erotica they really are out there there's some um, frolic me is one of them 
Joy Bear is another one that they are beautiful films. They're very female friendly. Like I said, they're pro port, they're pro love and sex. They're not, um, you know, if you're ethically disturbed by porn or you find it uncomfortable, you can really find good porn out there. And the other thing that's really big is audio porn. And women are very, we like sexy stories. Look at how, you know, Fifty Shades went. So if you type in audio porn, there's some great audio porn out there. So there are ways to become turned on by external stimulation without feeling uncomfortable or, or that traditional bog standard awful porn, which I agree is highly not helpful. And we've always got to remember that porn is entertainment. It's not a sex education class, which is what men tend to use it for. But um, sex toys, yes, they can solve a lot of your problems because... If you're single and you're not having sex with um, other people, you can have sex with yourself. I mean, a vibrator is still the most effective way to bring most women to orgasm. Um, if you're in a relationship where perhaps your partner doesn't want to have as much sex as you do, you can use a sex toy to keep yourself satisfied that way. They are a great way to keep your orgasm quota up. Um, because, you know, especially if you're a bit older and you're suffering from, some women get too sensitive, some women get undersensitive. And the thing about a vibrator is it doesn't get offended if you turn it up or down, so there's no issues with that. <laughs> but also fantastic yeah. or if, if you're not having penetrative sex with your partner and you want to do the use it or lose it, you can use a one vibrate, not a one vibrator, a very slim torpedo shaped vibrator to make sure that you're, you know, you're keeping your, you know, you're keeping up the use it or lose it thing for your genitals to stay in shape for when you start having sex again. And of course, the great thing about sex toys is that they're so easy to introduce variety is to get, I mean, the things that are selling the most for me at the moment are my couples kits, which are like five or six different things in a kit with a theme. And it's sort of the sort of thing where you go, okay, I wouldn't have thought to buy that sex toy, but hey, that's quite good fun. And it's just a bit of a laugh. They're inexpensive these days. They're not as tacky as they were. They're very beautiful to look at. And it's a quick, easy way to inject some, you know, make your sex life a bit fresh and frisky without having to think too hard. Thank you. <laughs> and um, we've got a question here for you, Ginny. Um, what effect does alcohol consumption have on libido and orgasm for men and women, for both? So for women, it is, for some women, it's the ultimate way to get in the mood. Yeah. And for some, it just sends them straight to sleep. And that <laughs> moment just goes and you're going to have sex, but now you're, you know, catching flies. Um, and then I think for men... It is a vasodilator, so that means it opens arteries, so it can help. But again, if you sort of cross that threshold and have too much, it can actually interfere with the erectile function. So, mm -hmm. and some guys will just go off to sleep. Um, five, we've, okay, so we've got five minutes left. So if you do have a question out there, now is your time to send it in. Um, Back to you, Tracy. Your last chapter is 50 things you only know after 50. So what are your absolute favourite pieces of advice on that list? Okay, I'd say the first one is that spontaneous sex is overrated and anticipation is a fine substitute because I think we're very hung up on the fact that we've got to suddenly, just out of nowhere, feel like sex. And in the book, there's a strong theme of, you know, planning sex is a very good idea. And in fact, I was talking to another sex therapist last week and doing a podcast, and he said in long-term relationships, if long-term relationships, if you left it up to spontaneous desire, you would only ever have sex on holidays. And I think that's probably just about right. And there's nothing wrong with like, my husband and I, we have Sunday sex. So on Sundays, Sunday today, by the way, so on Sundays we go, right, this is our sex day. And we plan it and we think of something new to do. And it's sort of like a good thing to look forward to. It's not like, oh my God, they've got it in the diary to have sex on Sundays. It's, we plan everything else in our lives. Like we don't just happen on a restaurant we look at which restaurant we're going to go to we look at the menu do we like this do we not and for some reason we have this big thing in our head a big mental block about planning sex but I'm a big fan of planning sex so that was one of my favorite quotes at the end yes that spontaneous sex is overrated and somebody has asked Tracy Tracy is there such a thing as a g-spot um well 
they again the, the jury's a bit out on that well what we do know is that the front wall of the vagina so the bit that's underneath your tummy is highly sensitive now whether that's an actual spot or not we don't really know but we do know that i mean lots of most women that they, they say all orgasms generate from the clitoris which is what i actually believe but mm -hmm. there is certainly strong evidence that the front wall of the vagina is the only other way that most women who say they have penetrative orgasms that's generally in a position where they're getting that part of their vagina stimulated so whether that is a g spot or whether that is just an area that's particularly sensitive um that would be my answer to that. What do you think, Jenny? Yeah, so I think a lot of people think that they know where the clitoris is and well done if you do, guys, especially. That's, you know, congratulations and mazel tov. But for, <laughs> in fact, what it does is it's like a little octopus and it has these tentacles that hang down and it actually extends, it's individual in every woman, but there's the button that we all know about, but it actually extends down. And in some women, it does actually have nerve fibres that extend into the vagina as well. Now that is highly individual, but it's not like the clitoris is that sort of, you know, half a centimetre by half a centimetre spot. And if you, you have to go really hard on that one, sorry, my hand gestures are awful. I'm gonna <laughs> sit on my hands now, but yeah, you don't have to go really hard on that one spot. It is actually like got quite good tentacles out there and, and extends. Well, I think um, if there's no more questions, I'm going to give you two minutes to send in anything else if anybody else wants to ask. Um, there is a question here, a technical question, Ginny. Um, what about Bartholin cysts in the vulva? Um, how do you get them? Are they transmissible to a partner? How do you get rid of them? So the Bartholin's glands are not dissimilar to the skein glands, you'll be thrilled to know. And they're basically glands that make lubricating fluid and they sit right at the entrance of what we call the introitus. So that's the entrance way to the, to the vagina, so where the vulva meets the vagina. And they can become quite enlarged and irritated and they can actually get really big, kind of, you know, as big as a golf ball. And now, sometimes they just spontaneously disappear, so they rupture, um, but other times we have to surgically remove them. So, no, you wouldn't be passing that to a partner, but I would, um, if you have them, and it's quite uncomfortable to have sex when they're there, especially if they're really big. So mm. I would actually go to your doctor, get them looked at, and normally you need to end up at a gynecologist. Okay, so I think um, we're going to, what's the time? Wrap it up right on time, 8.30. Um, Tracy, thank you for getting up early this morning and yes. joining us from London. And hold thank your book you. up, darling. Hold, hold your book up because you can order this book online, on Great Wheatstone. Sex. Oh, on Wheatstone New South Wales website. We've actually already got a link up there. So everyone tonight can just jump on our website. You'll see the Booktopia links of both the M Word and Great Sex Starts at 50. Um, and we really, really encourage everyone to buy these fabulous books. They're just wonderful. On that note, in our time-honoured tradition of wheat so we have thank you certificates that have been mailed out to the three of you. Tracy, thank you so much for getting up so early. Ginny and Jax, thank no you worries. so much for tonight. It's been such an informative, fabulous evening. Thanks to Danira for joining with us. It really is wonderful. Great organisation in the community. Um, and thank you all for, for coming on board and listening. Mm -hmm.